Today, we're here to give our first reactions and review of Tyler Perry's newest film, Mia Culpa, that debuted on Netflix in February 2024. Mia Culpa tells the story of a criminal defense attorney played by Kelly Rowland, who finds herself defending an artist who's played by Trevante Rhodes, who is accused of offing his girlfriend. So if you're familiar with Tyler Perry's thriller type films, then you'll have an idea of what you're in for with Mia Culpa. As always, we'll give our honest opinions of the film and talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm Height. And I'm Cherie. And you've discovered Axiom Amnesia. A lot of you requested that we cover this film, and I can't wait for us to talk about it. But first, we want to thank all of the supporters who helped to make this video possible. If you want your name to appear alongside these contributors, make a one-time donation via Cash App or click the thanks button on this video, or you can head on over to patreon.com slash axiomamnesia or become a channel member by clicking the join button to enjoy all of the benefits of becoming a monthly subscriber. There will be many, many spoilers and they're starting right now. Yes. All right. So... If you are familiar with Tyler Perry, then you kind of already know what to expect. Like if you've seen Acrimony and those types of thriller movies, then uh, by Tyler Perry, then you just sort of know. Yeah. So you may say, hey, what do they mean? It belongs on Tubi. So one of the hallmarks of a Tubi movie is there's going to be a huge twist at the end that come out of left field. that have nothing to do with the rest of the movie. Right. You didn't they didn't show you any of this. But now all of a sudden there's this twist that you never could have thought of because it didn't show up right mm -hmm. <laughs> throughout the film. And they do it for the sake of having a big twist. Yes. And, you know, it sort of reminds me of, you know, one of my well, you guys don't know, but what height knows one of my guilty pleasures is what I call like urban fiction or hood movie um, or hood books. Right. And so I would read a lot of urban fiction and stuff, and they are notorious for these kinds of twists uh, as well. And so I think we're seeing a lot more of those. And in fact, some of the urban fiction authors are bringing their books to life on film in places like Tubi and Amazon and stuff like that. So um, I think that that's probably why we're starting to see even more of the kind of Tubi type movies. I'm not we're not saying Tubi to, to be insulting, but to give you an idea of when we say Tubi, you know exactly what we're talking about. You know, this particular sort of I don't know if you'd call it a genre exactly, but I you think know, you that's just, what we're saying. When people say a Tubi movie, they're talking about a specific genre, but not actually talking about the platform or Tubi because Tubi gives a lot of gives chances to people who aren't, you know, that big, who may not yeah. have the more same. low budget operations yeah. and stuff like that, too. Yeah. So we get to see a lot more stuff than we did before. So I don't want you to take the title like a complete insult or anything like that. All right. So let's talk about who's actually in this movie. It's starring Kelly Rowland of, you know, obviously in, in, independent music fame, but she was in Destiny's Child. She's, you know, acted before, but this is the most recent thing I feel like I've seen her in where she's like the star. Yeah, I don't remember seeing her in anything. Well, she was in this movie back in the 2000s. I don't remember what year it came out, but it was called The Seat Filler. And it was she was starred in it with Dwayne Martin, I believe, uh, Tisha Campbell Martin's ex-husband. And, you know, but that was back in the day and that was more close to the time when, you know, she was more famous for Destiny's Child and all that. If you call Dwayne Martin Tisha Campbell's ex-husband, then I can call Kelly Rowland Beyonce's number two. Shut up. OK, see, this is coming up because right now <laughs> Kelly Rowland is sort of trying to get rid of some of the backlash where she... Um, allegedly walked off of t the Today Show. You know, they're trying to say it's because her dressing room was too small. Other people um, speculate that maybe it's because she was tired of people asking her questions about Beyonce and Beyonce, who just announced that she's going to have this. Well, she didn't exactly announce it, but she's got a couple country type songs that have come out. And, you know, Beyonce just overshadows everybody, including yeah. like Usher Super Bowl and all that whenever everybody. she decides to drop stuff. So, and, yeah. you know, when you're close to somebody that famous, people are going to ask you about them. And yes, they ju you just can't get away from it. Yes. So she was in it. So um, and then it also stars Trevante Rhodes. Um, I'm not as familiar with him. Do you re do you remember seeing him in anything before? I, I don't. Wasn't he in. Moonlight. 
He was in Moonlight. Was that him in Moonlight? Yes. It was him and Mahershala Ali. Mahershala Ali. Oh, okay. I got you. <laughs> you know what? Like, he seemed familiar, like, in a way, but I don't know. But um, anyway, so he's the one. And he played Mike Tyson in that movie that Mike Tyson ain't want nobody to see. They just said, we're going to make a movie on Mike Tyson. So, you know, it's a little questionable. He, his eyes, something about his eyes do kind of feel Mike Tyson, Tyson-ish. And I was thinking that as we were watching this. Um, and just so you guys know, we normally don't, you know, rush to watch new movies and try to get these reviews out. So if you like this, go to the comments and let us know whether you think right. we should also be covering the new stuff that comes out, um, you know, kind of giving our initial thoughts. And uh, if you don't want to see this type of stuff, give us that feedback as well. And then, you know, we won't waste yeah. our time trying to uh, get things out in a more timely fashion to you. And since you said that, one of the things is when I heard about this movie, it was, oh, a Tyler Perry movie is coming out. It's going to be this. So I'm thinking, you know, because Tyler Perry was kind of talking about or hinting that he was going to be doing stuff with more meaning and stuff. I was like, yes, let me make sure I mark this date. So when it's come out, I can see the new Tyler Perry because that blues movie or whatever it was. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The blues movie was supposed to be something that took him 30 years to finally come around to making. So I'm thinking when I see this, this is going to be some hard hitting drama. No, we're back to acrimony, <laughs> you know, like we're back to that level of, you know, what he's good at and what people enjoy from him. A lot of people enjoy those. Now, me in particular, I'm kind of like, yeah, but a lot of people do like it. But if we let, let's go back to Kelly Rowland, though. So she's really kind of the, the main star of this movie. And she is a, a defense attorney who meets, you know, uh, Travante Rhodes character. And he's an artist who's been accused of offing his girlfriend. Right. And so, you know, we are like, OK, of course, because in every Tyler Perry film, everybody's got these high power careers. You yeah, know, yeah. she's having marriage troubles. She's married to a doctor and stuff. And everything is very complicated in every aspect of everyone's lives. You know? But what did you think of Kelly Rowland as an actress? Uh, I didn't. It was parts where I was just like, no. But see, the thing is, when it comes to acting in films like this, you can do a great job, right? So part she did good jobs, but let's say she does a good job on the set, but then when they go and do ADR, then you may not be able to match that in the voice, which I think mm. would be harder because you're not playing off of everything that's going around being in a scenery and stuff. And for and those if, of you who don't know, the ADR is the part where they have to go in the studio and basically record a huge part of all the dialogue over again, because, you know, sound, especially when you're outside and other, you know, sound conditions is it's very hard to get good sound. And so they do a lot of that in the studio. And so you kind of have to be able to act it twice. Right. Right. You have to act it when you're there and then you have to match up the way you did it before or match your lips. And sometimes they even sneak in changing words and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, but I think she suffered from that where parts of it was like, well, this vocal performance ain't as good as it could be. Like it was one emotional part where I'm just like, no Kelly Rowland. Yes. But also you got to point to the editors and director too, because maybe it's just not the best take that was used. And then there's probably different reasons why you choose different takes. So I don't think it's an indictment on her acting in general, but mm -hmm. there's parts where I'm like, no, this doesn't fly. Well, for me, I, I looked at this movie and I felt like, OK, Kelly, for what this is, Kelly Rowland, I think, did a perfectly OK job. Like I wasn't like, oh, my gosh, she was the best actress. But her acting wasn't so bad that I was necessarily looking at it or reminded throughout that she was Kelly Rowland, except for the fact that she was completely, she looked like Kelly Rowling, which means she looks amazing. And she dressed like a supermodel throughout <laughs> this entire movie. They were in a part of Chicago that you will not see if you're black from Chicago <laughs> <laughs> or visit Chicago. But is the, uh, the one guy named Sean, the actor, the one who played her husband, her husband. Yes. Uh, Sean Sager, I think yeah. is how you say his name. Mm -hmm. it, there was one moment where I where he kind of got emotional. I was like, oh, that's the best acting in the entire movie. Yes. It's like during the big reveal toward the end, that, you know, <laughs> always happens in these sorts of movies. But what I also thought was kind of interesting, it's Sean Sager who played Kelly Rowland's character's husband. And then his brother, Nick um, Sager, I hope I'm saying that right actually played his brother in the movie. So the, you know, the deal behind them is that, you know, Kelly is married to this uh, doctor who basically is out of work because he had a, um, 
in a, a substance abuse issue. He's <laughs> and it's kind of like the irony of it. He's an anesthesiologist who Kelly Rowland's character says was like getting high on his own stuff. And so that is, you know, an unfortunate set of events. But that, you know, is meaning that Kelly is in the position, her character anyway. Mia, I, I don't know why I just want to call her Kelly. Maybe that's part of where it might have been unbelievable. Right. But uh, Mia is taking care of her hu- her husband, who's a doctor. Then he's, yeah. uh, he's biracial. So his mother um, is is white. And so. She's in this uh, film. Uh, she's played by Carrie O'Malley. And. So she's, you know, this woman who, you know, has these two sons and they're both high powered. Everybody's an attorney or a doctor. Yeah. You know, <laughs> The Tubi movies, you know, they have all a great number of tropes and cliches. Right. You set it up for the no good husband. He's out of work. He's living off of her. She's paying all the bills, making all this money. And I'm a super successful person. Man, no good. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the movie. And, and and that's what it comes down to. So, you know, when if I'm just strictly kind of looking at the acting, I think Kelly Rowland did, you know, she did it. She did it all right to good job, I guess, for what this is like, you know, we know going into this, this is not about the Oscars. It is not about like Sundance Film Festival or any, you know, types of things that probably would get awards. But it, it can be extremely entertaining. You know, it's it's more in, in, in my book, more in the like guilty pleasures category of entertainment. But a lot of people, these this particular genre is very popular. Um, so I can imagine that a lot of you out there like it. If you've seen it so far, go to the comments and let us know whether you liked it, what, what you thought of Kelly Rowland's acting. Um, and then a couple of other familiar faces, right? Because there was Angela Robinson, who I really liked a lot, who played in The Haves and The Have Nots because, you know, she's like this notorious character. And since The Haves and The Have Nots was really kind of like a nighttime soap opera, uh, it was very much, you know, she she just kind of brings this aura to the characters that you see yeah. her play. And I really liked her. So the movie is you know, I guess when it, I don't know what you're supposed to expect, right? When it comes on, is it just a drama? Is it just a romantic film, right? But then you have these elements where a character like this comes out and you like, oh, we got soap opera, horror, thriller sort of a thing, right? This conniving person is looking menacing. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> so that's, and I mean, enter Travante Rhodes, right? He's like this mysterious, supposedly be like, you know, this um, artist, who is eccentric and, you know, good looking, sexy type of guy who's kind of swoop, swooping in. Right. Yeah. And he kind of talks like me all sexy and whatnot. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> no, he's talking all slow and light, you know mm-hmm. how, you know, to get the ladies all worked up. And he's the very opposite of her husband, who seems to be very high strung and, you know, um, not free and you know they kind of touch on that in, yeah. in, in, in the, the more tropes and cliches where mm-hmm. this guy you're free you're willing to be adventurous and show her show a woman things they've never seen before and that and the, the husband he is all boring and everything but then on top of that he ain't got no job and he got a substance abuse problem it's just everything like as I'm watching this is everything is just to the max. You can't yeah. just be like, okay, the guy just lost his job and they're having financial troubles. He is cheating and he lost his job and he got substance abuse problems, you know. Well, he's appearing to be cheating and everything like yeah. that, you know. But um, you know, so then this kind of brings me next to the cinematography, then we'll talk about the plot. I mean, by cinematography, we're not gonna get all technical, but what I will say is Comparing it to Acrimony, um, I believe Acrimony, I think if I recall, it was made in like two weeks. It was filmed in something ridiculous. And it might even been less than two weeks. It was just a ridiculous amount and then a, a ridiculously short amount of time. And when Tyler Perry came out, he was bragging on it, right? Yeah. And we're going to get to Tyler Perry in a minute, but not right now. So he was bragging on, hey, you know, it only took this long to film. We, I wrote this and we got it out. But it looked like it took about that time to it was just shoddily put together and so i think maybe tyler perry learned his lesson with this the 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 shots and everything like it looked at least like a quality film yeah. even if it potentially was lacking in other areas and he didn't rely on those same wigs to try to change the characters i guess the men i guess used their natural hair but with the cinematography i think that 
it had some very it had some good parts. You know, the lighting was good except for the dark scenes. Like every movie now is too dark mm. when it's supposed to be dark. And they're saying that people are doing this because it's supposed to mimic normal lighting and all of this, but we don't want normal when we watch movies for the most part, right? I want to be able to see it. Well, and have y'all ever watched a movie and in the daytime and literally it's so dark, you have to kind of pull your blinds or whatever. And even then some just to be able to see the screen, you can't have any light in the room because <laughs> otherwise you're not going to actually be able to see what is on film. And a film where that happened a lot was Nope, um, Jordan Peele's Nope. I, it was, there were so it, many dark parts in that movie that you can't watch it. In they the didn't even film at it at night. Yeah, yeah. They trick you into. Uh, that's what I didn't like about that movie. But the doing night and darkness is not is not what's up. Which you know bring me to kind of like something I just read that Tyler Perry is talking about with AI and stuff. He was going to expand his studio but now he's not going to do it because all you got to do is type some stuff in and you could create whatever set or scene that you want <laughs> I, you know like i just feel that tyler perry is going to use this to continue to cut out uh, <laughs> the, more designers artists and right people exactly. scouting uh location scouts and, and, and stuff. filming on location and we're going to get like cheesy backgrounds which we can kind of discuss a little bit you know, well, I guess now because we're at the part where we talk about the plot. OK, to me, this film has plot problems, believability issues, starting with even in the first few minutes of the film. You know, she's an attorney. She's saying and doing things that I'm not an attorney. Um, we know plenty of attorneys, but we're not attorneys, but we know enough to know this doesn't sound right. Yeah. I was happily surprised when I saw that it was being filmed in Chicago, but there were issues with that because I'm from Chicago, you guys know, right? <laughs> so, uh, but there were issues with that. I mean, just it's the little things. And when you start m messing up the small details, and I know that that's not accurate, then it just continues to chip away at the believability of the film. Yeah, throughout. but, you know, from what I know about attorneys or what I would assume an attorney would be, I've just kind of seen what's going on with Finding Willis and them down there. And it's just kind of like, well, up in Fulton, down well, in Fulton County. You know, County. attorneys just be doing whatever, too, just like everybody else. Bruh, listen, <laughs> we are like, not supposed to be talking about but all that. Because that's what this you have attorneys who's making decisions with her client. And, you know, whether or not somebody was should recuse themselves come up when I'm thinking about the believability of this. But it's just happening like when it's. You have Clarence Thomas and stuff taking payments and stuff and then ruling on cases involving the lobbyists the who's who been paid. flying you, exactly. getting you flued out. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. That it's, it's crazy. When you see it in a movie and I expect there to be some sort of some pointing to some moral authority, right? To say these are the morals set in this film universe that that's not there. And then they just do whatever to no repercussions or anything. So it just allows for the fiction to get to get away from us just yeah. get out of hand yeah and i think we have to just okay so let's just be specific like one of the things uh it's filmed in chicago it's all supposed to be taking place in chicago and at one point somebody starts talking about because you know we're talking about a murder case somebody starts talking about uh the da okay there is no da because their their state's attorneys is is what they call them there. You know, people who follow the case of um, Mr. Kelly and other famous people who have been tried there. Um, and, or who, if you're from there, then you recognize like it's not there's no D.A. Yeah. that's there. It's the state's the attorney. The Cook County um, state's attorney. You know, and so it it bothered me. That little thing bothered me. But then right. that adding that with other things that were said. Yeah, that you're she like, was mm. like. Oh, do you want to get the lethal injection or something? Yeah, and there's no death penalty in right. Illinois. And it hasn't been for a while. Big spoiler alert. The movie is about some woman who is supposedly killed. Yes. By this guy. By her but boyfriend. They yeah. haven't found the body. It, and You're we, not there's not gonna be a capital murder case right there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I all already know, like, you know how sometimes in the beginning, you're trying to give it a chance. But then like halfway through the movie, because the movie is like an hour and 50 minutes or something like that. Right. And to get, as you know, halfway through, you know, it's starting to lose me and you're sort of half watching and you start picking up your cell phone again or, you know, wanting to look and check messages. That's like the hard part about some of these films. And I will admit that it right. was starting to lose me 
as the film yeah. went on because I was like, okay, I might as well buy my time so, for the big reveal. You yeah, know? because so <laughs> let me give you a short thing of what the movie is. So it starts off, they basically, she basically gets this case. Her and she is a defense attorney for this, uh, oh, I don't want to go too much in detail, for this guy. And then the prosecutor is her brother-in-law. Right. And then she gets in a relationship with her client basically for about most of the movie. Half of the movie is about just them being in a relationship. Him reeling her in. Ooh, yeah. You know? And then, oh, she quit. And then you have a partial reveal of is something else going on. Ooh, the woman is not dead. I could, I'm predicting this because there is no body. So we know if, you know, you a a uh, half-assed writer that all you're going to do is say, oh, ain't nobody, the body showed up. And I think that's kind of what happened in Fall from Grace. Something about the body wasn't there well, or something. He and, wasn't dead. Yeah, and, and then Fall from Grace is a whole nother, yeah. that's exactly it. And so... And they, a twist that don't matter. So they're in a the great relationship. And then the twist has a twist, right? Because it's like, boom, you get a great reveal. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Then you get another reveal. Even the twist right, is not the twist. Right, but the whole thing know? is... For half of the movie, it's just about them being in a relationship. There's nothing going on there, nothing in the story. And then when the big reveal comes, it turns into like a thriller and then it turns into a horror. It, But none of that has anything to do with basically, for the most part, with them being in a relationship. But then we, while we're in a relationship, I'm going to turn into some other film uh, maker. And then we get into the sexual stuff. And let me stuff. tell you, we've we've done... Okay, so at this point, we haven't just totally told you everything, but you might want to click away or make sure you watch the film after this point, because I'm going to just go ahead and just break it down so that we can just actually mention also, because Hype gave a lot of detail, but I'm just going to say what happens in the end of the movie so that we can just on paper see how <laughs> outlandish this is, right? So basically, she's been sleeping now. Okay, let's back up. She winds <laughs> up sleeping with her client, who is this artist who's been accused of um you know murdering his girlfriend but there's no body but he's up for you know murder and then on top of that the reason she sleeps with him because she's attracted oh, to him and he's yeah. all mysterious but she thinks her husband has cheated on her because right? somebody sent a picture and said look he's going to this hotel room right and it turned out to be for you can't a, see the person's face mm -hmm, who he's going in with another reason and i was like mm, I, I said we're all we all know that we're going to find out that she cheated out of vindictiveness or whatever. And then he didn't even actually cheat. Right. Yeah. This is, you know, we're going to find this out later. So, you know, your lips are already pursed. Half ass writers do yes. that all the time. So we know then, it's coming. Then you get to the point where you're like, okay, so now it's time for the big reveal. All right. We find out that the girl, you know, th there's no body for this girlfriend. And then it's just really, really stupidly complicated. Yeah, and you find out because this attorney, Mia, she is in the Dominican Republic and she just is walking and sees the woman. Right, who because she's fled because it's been exposed that she slept with her client, right? So <laughs> she, you know, so she fled to get get away from it all. I've hopped on a plane. I went to the not even the Dominican Republic. I went to the DR, you know, because now we just go to the DR. You know, that's what Santo we do. Domingo. Um, and so she's there and she runs into the chick who's supposed to be dead. <laughs> right. And so then you're like, OK, so the, so what's going on here now? You know that they're not showing the creepy mother in law and the brothers and all of these other yeah. characters because there weren't that many other characters in the in the film. So you're like, they're showing us these other characters for a reason. What is their role? In yeah, all of exactly. This? And you show. But this is going on for a long time till we even get to this point. And then she's like, I see him. And then I'm like, so as an attorney, you contact the prosecutor and possibly the judge to be like, hey, there is no body, but I seen the person. But she didn't do take any care to make sure that she got a picture or film it, you know, just typical right. movie stuff. She stops the woman. Hey, you're hey. the woman who's supposed to be dead. And she you know? took her phone and ran off. So and then the woman squirted her in the face with cleaning <laughs> chemicals. But if, because, of course, she's in another country being like the maid at a resort. Right. Yeah. Because, you know. Yeah. And then she uh, calls her brother in law, who is the prosecutor, like, hey, he is not guilty <laughs> as an attorney. That's the first thing she says. Yeah, he didn't do it. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right. But not before all of, you know, all of this basically hate and shade has been put on the actual guy because he's got this torrid sex life where he's 
you know, basically, I wouldn't call it swinging because you have to have a mate for that. But, you know, he's going to these sex clubs and doing all that kind yeah. of stuff, you know. But then the prosecutor is like, oh, he's not guilty. So the prosecutor's like, oh, you're sleeping with him. What are you talking about? And she's like, she's not dead. And the prosecutor don't believe her mm-hmm. because their relationship is all messed up now. So Because he- she's cheating on his brother. Yeah. Like, that, That's what came out. And now... The one who you've been smashing, you saying is not guilty and you just happen to come across the woman, the right. woman in so DR. He's like, oh, well, come to the house. I'm going to take care of it. The brother in law does the who's the prosecutor. We're, we're going to get our, uh, you know, investigator out there right away to handle all of this. So she goes to the house and then they start acting real creepy. This is another thing Tyler Perry bothered me about, because the scenes where they're at the house with the creepy mother, um, will remind you a lot of the movie Jordan Peele's Get Out, right? Kind of how creepy the um, yes, once that family flip was of switched, the girlfriend. Right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like, you can't get out of here. Yeah, you can't leave. So, so now it flips into Get Out 2.0 Tyler Perry style and everybody in the house who you know, is now against her. But her husband is not there, though. But it's her husband's brother, her husband's mother, and her sister-in-law who's married her, to her uh, brother-in-law, you know. And it just is like whose role didn't have to even be in there, but but they were no her role had to be in there because then they have the next big <laughs> reveal, right? She goes and she realizes, oh, they have something to do with this, and then the brother reveals we set it all up. Now, mind you, there's this subplot going on where the mother is all needy because she has cancer supposedly and she's sick. Well, it's revealed that the mother-in-law never had the cancer, yeah. and you know they she been gets plotting. this information on her phone, and then she sees like. Uh, is what are those rooms called where they develop photos and yeah, stuff? Yeah, dark room. Yeah, she goes into a dark room, sees a picture of her sister-in-law, comes out, and then the mother-in-law is there, hits her basically, make her drop her phone, but but so she can't use her phone to call for help or whatever. She drops down and breaks the phone with her knee. Yeah, she just like <laughs> in what world? And she's is, like, oh, your phone doesn't work I'm anymore. I'm so sorry, and but but she's supposed to be like this feeble woman who's de- you know debilitated from chemotherapy and all. Like it is just <laughs> so. I mean, it has really like the movie jumped the shark at this point like two or three times. And then, so then it is further revealed. So now we know that not only did she sleep with this artist, but then we see that the sister-in-law has slept with the artist, but we still don't exactly know the circumstances. So then the brother-in-law reveals, okay, you know, here's what happened. And then basically it's like, my wife, you know, slept with this guy and we hooked this whole thing up. Yeah. So the whole thing is, the, the, the artist is set up with this murder because... The brother-in-law's wife slept right. with the artist who is, and you know, sleeping with every woman under the sun. The brother-in-law, who is the prosecutor, made up the cancer diagnosis so he could get sympathy for votes. For his mother, because now he's also going to run for that uh, had mayor. N- nothing in the movie, nothing to do with this. Why is that there? Yes. So it's all over <laughs> the place. So the, and then just when you think, you know, everything. So you're like, oh, OK, the guy really didn't do it. You know, the misdirection that happened. OK, so that's all resolved. But the question is still the jury is still out on like, what is the status of her actual husband? Does um, Kelly Rowland's husband know that? his family's up to no good or not. So, you know, she's got to fight her way out of it and stuff like that. Then at one point, uh, you know, the, they instruct, they instruct her sister-in-law, go ahead, stab her, you know, because (laughs) it just was like, they were acting like they had mind control over her or something. They were like, go ahead, you can do it, stab her. (laughs) And so then she's just like, and she's like, no. And she's still on the side of, you know, her friend, her sister-in-law. So she tries to fight and, you know, the sister-in-law winds up getting stabbed stabbed and presumably dies or whatever at the hands of the uh, mother and then you know she's fighting her way she fights her way out of there the mother's on the front of the car trying you know trying to get uh, get her and then you know again it's like horror movie movie. get out it's horror horror movie movie running to the tree yes you run into the tree and she's propelled onto the ground after that blah 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 and then running away and there's a car coming up the street. But, so this is the part that just make total no sense, right? So she is basically getting away. The woman is on the car. You're at their house. Mm-hmm. The woman gets on the car, hit a tree before you can leave. And then she starts running down the street. Yeah. So she's running, running away. Remember that. Why is it always that you see headlights? Oh, help. You start waving. Listen, 
I don't know about y'all. Y'all tell us in the comments. But if I'm running away from a house where somebody's done something and I see headlights, I'm hiding in the bushes or something. I'm not hopping out like, help me, help me. I'm just like trying to get away from that house as far as I can. Yeah. But she, so she flags the car down. Who is it but her of husband? Of course it is. And then Everything he's like, what happened? Up. What happened? I'm calling 911. He's like, yes, 911. Tell me. And then, you know, he's like, tell me what happened. And uh, she finally suspects that maybe her husband is not on her side. And so she uh, he's talking on the phone. He's really talking to his brother back at the house. Like, <laughs> yeah, you got to get her and bring her back. And so she presses the Bluetooth button on the car. And then, you know, we can hear through the car speakers, the brother on the phone. And it's not really yeah. 911, blah, blah, blah. So at this point, they're driving for a while towards the house. Yes. And she's like, why are we going back towards the house and all this before she hits the button? And then they're sitting for a while. I guess they're figuring out what they're going to do. And, you know, that whole point where you got the menacing person who's like, I had to do this, uh-huh. you know, and then basically that's it. And then she they get into a mini fight and, you know, take the wheel and hits a truck. Yeah. And then a big a, a 18 wheeler. And he's ejected out of the car yeah. and he's, you know, on the ground. And so, uh, yeah, she ran some miles had to be because this exchange and all of this was a long time because all he did was pick her up while she was running down the street and headed back towards the house. Well, and was- this truck had to come from somewhere that was kind of far away because where else was he coming from? And there was nothing done cinematically, right, that tells you the passing of time. You know how sometimes like they can do like a break or like a um, like a fade that will let you know time has passed. But you, as opposed to this, the hard breaks in the in, in the, you know, from clip yeah. to clip. So we didn't know that. See, that's a, that's a director could have like helped us understand that. Right. Um, so then yeah. this is what happens. And then the end, basically, you know, it's like, oh, and then you see the same and then it's scene. just over. It's just over. You see the same scene that you see at the end of every horror film where you have the, uh, you know, the, the media is there. We're on the scene of, a, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like it's, and, and this is what happens at the end. And then finally he's released and whatever. And, um, you know, he sends her a message saying he hopes to see her soon. This is the artist, right, who's who was wrongfully accused and he's out of uh, jail at this point. And, and he's like, I would hope to see you again soon. But of course, she throws her phone in the garbage, you know, because she has watched him. You know, she's incognito. She's the only one in all black and dark sunglasses standing across the street from where he's, you know, walking out of jail. But and no one notices her, of course. Um, and you know, and then that's like yeah. the end of the movie. Right. That's and it. That's it. But the way it ended with where I think it ended, you hit the truck and bam, he flies out, basically presumes he's dead. And then it's just over. It's like a number of tropes just strung together. You've seen them once. You've seen them all. You yeah. s- if you saw Acrimony, you saw this. You saw. I mean, right. the story is slightly they different. They even had but... an eyes wide shut moment. <laughs> it was Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. Yeah. So so let, that brings us to what I would just kind of call like the gratuitous sex scenes and Tyler Perry trying to be edgy in his film. So, you know, this artist is supposed to be so out there. That, you know, he's in enti- This is how he's reeling her in. He's enticing her. At one point, he goes and, you know, leads her essentially into this, I mean, underground kind of, I guess you call it a sex club. Yeah. Um, and then after that happens, then he has, he, he, she, I mean, how would I say this? He invites her over, but he's got a woman there who's. Even in the Nike. cast, I think it's called The Pleaser. Like, so she's, she's there. She's called to, The Pleaser. That is in IMDb. Let me see. In IMDb. She is called, oh, I'm sorry, Pleasure Girl. Oh, okay. You know, um, <clears throat> so he's Pleasure got this girl. woman who's just like totally nude and she's there and, and he had just made an advance to her. So I was like, okay, so what are they going to do? Like a threesome or what? But, you know, so we still don't know. She's like shy at first. And then she finds out that her husband, she believes her husband is cheating. So then she goes back into where he is with this woman. By now, he has watched her like he, you know, she's giving him, um, you know, pleasures while she's, she's being on pleasure her. Girl. Yes, she's being pleasure girl. And, 
you know, he's watching her and they're making eye contact and it's supposed to be all, you know, just so, you know, amazing. And I was like, this is so cheesy, edgy, though. Like, it's not really yeah, hot. That's why I like it's a bunch of different movies, a bunch of different genres, because like this mm, part in the middle together. of the movie, like, why is it turned into Fifty Shades all of a sudden? You know, and, and so I was just like, Ugh, right. You and know. see, none of that stuff had anything to do with any of the twists or any really except for some stuff where he likes to paint them. And well, I guess stuff. we were supposed to feel like in her shoes, like understanding why a woman who thinks her husband is cheating and she is kind of attracted to the um, artist guy could be reeled in to cheat on her husband. And then we're supposed to identify with her. We're supposed to think this artist is so sexy. But I was all I could think was just like, ew. I'm like, she's making all these terrible decisions. I don't know how I just can be on the side of this character but look she comes back up to where he is in the bed with this woman she walks in on them while they're in the bed and the woman gets off dude doesn't even get a wash rag on himself Ugh, and then stop. he's i'm just being real and then <laughs> th but this is supposed to be sexy and then you know the woman dismisses herself and leaves and so she's there with the guy and now she can get her chance but then he starts making you a move and then they seconds. stop yeah i was like this is nasty man that you know and but it's just it, 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 it's just nasty <laughs> and i just was like oh hey. but to some people it may be yeah. okay so here's the thing if i was gonna set up that scene then like make the scene like a threesome scene you know what i mean like make it like, like that type of thing the, yeah. like she came back to participate because with that's the both what should have happened after you didn't show me that they done went to this club this underground club and that's mm -hmm. the you enter the i don't want to call it freakish but you out there yeah, you you're, went you're there. You saw him do this. So now, when you come back, it's supposed to be that's what you want now. Yeah, you're like, ooh, this has piqued my interest. You know. Yeah. And so then, like, you're supposed to just be like, I'm fluid. I'm, you know, coming in, you know, being with this dude, and oh, it's gonna be the three of us. You know, like this is the experience in the moment. Okay, that's what is supposed to be happening. But instead, like the way Tyler Perry presented it, it was like this gross situation <laughs> and it just wasn't it was a huge miss so yeah. then i was just like but it didn't i was belong grossed in the movie at all out either. i was grossed out so then after that happens and then she goes and he got they got to ride on a motorcycle and so she can be comfortable and whatever and then she finally goes back and they get to have their moment together gee i hope that dude you know like got the funk of the other woman off of him before they did you know their part or whatever but it just wasn't no. it just ruined it for me yeah so what do you think of the character development? Because I think they were trying to show us. He was trying to show us. He's the writer and everything. He was Tyler Perry was trying to show us the artist's character. Yeah, like I think, but, but it was I don't very, think it did. It was very stereotypical, though, right? Because it was. End, I think it was trying to be Fifty Shades type. Yeah. Well, at the end, it was like okay, so. To string you along, you're supposed to believe that this guy is, you know, reeling in these women and, and, and having these encounters because he's harming them in some way. Right. Because he's up for, you know, murder. But at the end of it, you realize that this guy is just somebody yeah. who liked to, you know, have these conquests yeah. and these encounters. And that's what it was. And that was his thing. And OK, right. you know, OK, no judgment so if that's to it. put some brilliance on um, Tyler Perry. We can say he wasn't like a painter type artist. He was a pleasure artist. Shut up. Right? So because that's what he was doing. He was doing all this for pleasure. And then you had the one lady who was like, well, he is playing with me as his canvas or something. Some similar to that. Right? So he wasn't really about the oh, art. Yeah, to show yeah. who this character is. To be like, oh, he's an artist. He's this. But when you wrap it up into that primal uh, instinct of pleasure of certain yeah, one, yeah. then it's kind of like, oh, he's just... This was his inspiration. This is what he does, and he just happens to paint so that he can do this. Not that he paints because it's an extension of that sexual passion. Hmm. He's just all, it's all wrapped up in there together. Yeah. And so I just want to put like, paint all over us like, like booty talk, <laughs> Shut like up. booty talk oil paintings <laughs> is basically what he was doing. Oh my gosh, if you know, And he's you like, know. here's the abstract art we made with these different color paint. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> That's what he was doing. You did not say booty talk. I'm done.
Uh, <laughs> but uh, for those of you who are old enough, you <laughs> it may sound familiar. Um, but at any rate, like that's it. So so yes. Yeah, so in their big scene where they have their one on one uh moment, you know, they're like they got paint all over themselves. Some of the angles were a little gross to me. The best that I would say is that at the end, you know, they've got paint all over themselves. And when they're when they finally stop and they fall asleep and they do look like artwork on a canvas. Right. Huh. OK, I'll give you that, Tyler Perry. Yeah, that was I was but like, that's okay, the, that would okay, be the I cinematographer. That. That's the art of the filmmaker, not the art of the artist in the film. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah, I, was I know. The, I, I know. Was, that's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying, but you have to show the art of the the artist in the, artist film. In the film. Yeah, yeah. And he was basically doing portraits of all the women that he had boned. And that's I mean, all that's he would do. It. Like it's like, dang, bro, you're not an artist at this point. Yeah. So, but I guess that's, that's to say, like maybe we can't say that Luther Campbell is not an artist, though. Or. When you have um, like Uncle Luke. cocktails from uh-huh. too short, you can't say that's not art. Or what do you want from a Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's all. It's, look, just, it's, it's, it's basically it's, that's he is that version of the, <laughs> he of is the, the explicit rapper. visual artist. <laughs> all I do is smash and then make paintings of it. You know, or make paintings of my conquests. Yeah. Right? So, so, so that's a very fascinating aspect of. Um, you know, what happened with the art in the film. But also I was interested to know, um, like, because this is a question and we talk about this in other films and other people have had things to say. But, you know, the the issue of a person who is famous or how famous you are and whether or not you would be nude in the film. Whether or not you're going to take it off. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, wow, is Kelly Rowland going to, because, you know, this film did have some nudity. And so I'm like, uh, is Kelly Rowland going to like be topless in here? Like, what's going to be the deal? And so I would say it was very for for today's world, you know, in the world of, you know, hands on your knees, you know, in that world, it's it was very tame. Yeah. Um, you know, they kind of backed away and blurred it. But she's an older point. woman, too, though. Like we're getting to the point where we're telling the old stories before we weren't getting the old folks stories. Hmm. But she I don't know how old is she supposed to be in this movie? Uh-oh. I mean, because, you know, Kelly Rowland is early 40s, early to mid 40s at this point. And, you know, but 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 you know how it is on film. They'll be like, I'm 36. And, you know, <laughs> so yeah, we really don't know. What was the arc of Mia, though? Well, her arc was that she married a guy who was safe and she wanted a guy who she wanted. You know, she wanted a guy who was um, spontaneous, I think, was the words that she used or whatever later. And she had to cheat to get. And him. so, okay. you know, he he she was tempted by this man because. You know, he he. Oh well, at one point when she wanted to hurt her husband, she was like, "Cause you weak and he's strong." He was strong, yeah. dominating. And some of the character was talking about his size too. Mm-hmm. All of all of that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about his size, like his male size. Yeah, you know. But and like her, what does she do? She started off like that. She fell from grace. <laughs> but so. What helps her arc is what we talked about earlier, where it's like, okay, now I want to do the three way. Mm -hmm. But that's not what happened. She kind of just went there. She just tried to be with the one. She dismissed the other chick and was like, I'm be with the one guy. So like she really wasn't. Yeah. Did she change at all? From who she was. I I think she got smarter, right? Because I wondered if at the end, when he wanted to get with her, would she go back and get with him? Bro, that's like... After finding out he was innocent. That's the Hail Mary at the end. That's not... But... (laughs) All right. Up until the last one... 60 seconds of the film, how did she change? You know what I'm saying? I guess the main part is that she was willing to, you know, sleep with a client as an attorney. And And before she she probably wouldn't have. And before she would have... Not that, but then it was like stupid. But that's a that's taking that's did. a ne- negative trajectory, right? Well, yeah, it's definitely a negative. Like you got to redeem yourself Her arc somehow. Is <laughs> <laughs> you have to be like, I was like this. I didn't trust my husband well, and all of this. Well, her redemption was fighting for him to be free when she knew that he had been sleeping with all these women, including her sister in law, okay. and doing the right thing. So she did the right thing in the end, which was try to fight for him to free, be free in spite of. But I think embarrassing you kinda, herself. Re- re- you're required to do that as an attorney too. I think. 
Well, you also are probably required not to sleep with the other people that too. if you're married. That's you know? we, so like, I guess that's the redemption. But from the beginning, I don't think she believed him, which was very questionable because she was talking to somebody to her husband. I think she's like, I defend murderers all the time. Yeah. Like, wait, what? Yeah, I don't think she believed him. I just think she, her interest in the beginning was money, right? Because, you know, you got the husband. You got a nice place. You living rich. And somebody yeah. got to bring home the bacon So here. I guess it's like, okay, I can now start believing that clients are not guilty. But it's not made abundantly clear. It's not even hinted at, really, as that is how she changed. But well, I guess we can glean that from what we saw. One philosophy I have is that... I think a lot of defense attorneys don't care if the person is guilty. I think it doesn't even matter or because I'm <laughs> going to just shut up. They don't care either. I'm going to defend as a as the prosecutor. I think the attitude is I don't care. What I, I want to know everything so that I can know how best to defend you. But my goal is to defend you and present you as yeah. not and guilty. And the prosecutor is like, I'm going to just take evidence and prosecute somebody and yeah. get a guilty verdict. And it's so, you know, I'm going to reverse engineer this. And... You know? <laughs> Yeah. And so when you got when you get like this and it's to the extreme that the prosecutor has basically framed somebody because of an extramarital affair, it's like, come on, bro. Mm hmm. This is way out there. Yep. But that's I mean, to me, that's that's kind of where it was left. Um, so if you can't tell, like if you enjoy these kinds of movies, then it's not going to bother you. But uh the writing was lacking you know the, the just the overall plot and execution it just was just kind of ridiculous um yeah. because i couldn't help but think like her character is stupid like why are you doing these stupid things it's one thing if you understand how somebody gets caught up and i think that's what we were supposed to do in here was to understand yeah i don't understand but how. it was just like elementary tricks that we're getting her caught up and it just didn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, it's like, so. oh, oh, and you you were saying that one of the scenes was ghost? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so this, this, there's this part where he's reeling her in and he comes behind her and he's having her close her eyes and paint together and stuff like that. I said, this ain't nothing but ghost <laughs> repackaged where you know where Patrick Swayze is up behind Demi Moore and they mold in the clay and whatever and it's all sexual. Like, that's, come on. Like that oh, was man. ghost to me. Yeah, but that's basically what happened. And it was points where you're an attorney. This is your client. How many? But that's why I question, like, how many of your other clients have you done this sort of thing with? Because it was so easy for him to just be like, come on over here and be my be in my bed. Because there's points where, OK, I don't want you as a client anymore because of you making sexual advances at me and mm -hmm. all this other stuff that you're doing. But it's like, oh, he's really slowly uh, guiding her this way. And he, I guess he just has this aura where he gets every woman he, he could wants just, somehow. All he has to do is figure out what and, he wants. But I don't know he always how good it. looking women think this guy is. But maybe that's just it. He just looks so good. Then you well, just can't help it. I, you know, so what I think it's supposed to be is not, I mean, you know, obviously the guy's not ugly. But I think it's supposed to be his. His, his riz? It, yeah. His, his riz, his charisma, his sex appeal. Um, and just that he is so like strong and just dominant that that that, that, that your, is his you put your career yeah. on the line. Yeah, because a lot of a lot of people would have said that her, you know, husband or her brother in law, that they would feel like those two guys were more physically attractive. But, oh. you know, this guy's Riz is like, oh. on, you know, 10,000. So, you know, he it just I mean, you know. He just is, he got it like that with the women, right? Uh, he's cool. He's got the full beard and everything happening. You know, all the stuff that has you where you pop in, in nowadays. And yeah. Oh, okay. You know, but. Well, I can see that. Uh, that's what I think his appeal was supposed to be. Yeah. Um, but some things in the beginning that really got me, you know, is that the believability of some things like she, he came to her. The artist came to her yes. and was like, I want you to defend me. And she is like, I can't because my brother-in-law is prosecuting that. But I'm going to take a look at what the prosecution has when she hasn't even been hired and there hasn't been any discovery or any of that. Like, Yeah, like stuff how isn't... are you entitled to that if you right. didn't even the yeah. attorney? And if you are his attorney, then it probably could be the prosecutor who's just like, well, I can't really take this case. Well, we're we back to, to the whole thing else. about like you need Tyler Perry 
really does need to have more consultants, more people to, you know, vet the believability of his stuff. But I feel like he thinks it doesn't matter. He thinks but the, it does 90 if 90 percent or not even 90. I would say if 75 percent of the people don't know enough to know that what you're saying is kind of inaccurate and it's not paramount to the story. You think it doesn't matter. I would say 90 percent. OK, 90. But yeah, I think that's the case, though. Depending on what type of okay, but art think about this: make. when you're doing it quote right, in my opinion, there's a reason why shows like Grey's Anatomy and whatever have all of these like medical experts who are like, no, you have to attempt a t- intubation this way, and this is what it's supposed yeah. to look like, and this is this is because they're trying to be as accurate as possible, not because they think we're about to start, you know, performing medical procedures at home, but because it enhances the believability for people who yeah. actually do know right? and it yeah, because, makes it even better yeah because some of the conditions and stuff people who are watching have been in those positions to know like oh it don't even work like that even if you're not a medical professional or if you're not a in a legal profession you know from your own experiences like oh this doesn't work like that or this doesn't this chicago doesn't have a district attorney's office yes per se in that in title you know and those sort of things where yeah but i think that because most people don't know then you can get away with it sort of like with the science movies when you're talking about the physics of gravity and all of those sort of things where most of the people don't know then you can get away with whatever and still have a movie that a lot of people enjoy yeah even though there may be a small number of people say 10 percent, who's just like yeah this don't make sense yeah. And, and I, you know, and I'm open to that. Like, I really I am open to that. But let me just bring up a little devil's advocate piece of why I think you should be if you can be more responsible, especially about things that are about legal things, because people, whether they should or shouldn't take what they see in these shows as like the truth, how it um, is. So and I, what's if, acceptable. If, yeah, what's, what's acceptable. Not, yeah. If I if I have a legal case pending and then I hear a lawyer that's saying some something that's total BS, but sounds, uh, you know, snazzy to the person who doesn't know, yeah. then they go oh, yeah. thinking that they're making the right decision. Oh, yeah, in this the happened real to Mia Culpa and he yeah. got away with it so and he got maybe off. I should do that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so like so to me, I think that's the responsibility to the community and to the viewers to try to be as accurate as possible. And Tyler, you can't tell me Tyler Perry doesn't know this because, he, but I think he just is like, it doesn't matter, but yeah. he, he knows that he's not, because again, this was like written, directed and everything under yeah. the sun, everything except acted by Tyler. So, Perry, <laughs> As usual. Every time we, not every time, but a lot of times when we talk about Tyler Perry movies, we have big portions that we actually cut out of the videos that y'all don't hear, but we still have them. And maybe we'll put them out sometime if y'all go <laughs> ahead and sign up for Patreon or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Mia Culpa. Why do you think he named it that? Because, I don't know. Trying to play on her name, but it, it basically means my fault or sort of like, uh, basically an apology or an admission of being at fault for something. And I guess it's like, oh, I cheated with the client. So it's partially my fault that he was going to take a deal because we didn't say that he was basically going to take a deal after she had to step down because of that. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, and then it's yeah. like, but whose fault is it? Because you could look at it as being a lot of, you know, this man wouldn't have been caught up if he wasn't sleeping with all them women who were married. <laughs> and otherwise, you know, everybody, it was everybody's fault or they all contributed to being in the position that they were in. So maybe it's about all everyone's fault. Too. Yeah. So but, it, it, it could be, although her name was in it because it just is a, you know, I guess that was cute. I guess. You know, it was a cute. Cute. All right, Fanny. <laughs> Don't get cute. Don't get cute with me. <laughs> it was cute. So, um, but yeah, so that's basically kind of what that name means. And, you know, you could explore it. Um, and, and, you know, I always fight when people are like, it ain't that deep. It ain't that deep. But because I feel like our black cinema definitely can be and is that deep. And it's deep enough if you want to yeah. think about it. And it's In as this deep case, as the person who's thinking about it. Yeah. I, I just at this point. I just choose not to contemplate exactly who it is. We just kind of did a superficial review of who it could be. Um, If you guys think that we should do a breakdown or more in depth, or if there are things that we didn't talk about with this film that you think we should be talking about, let us know in the comments right now. But we also should talk about this mother-in-law relationship that was happening there. 
So the mother-in-law was very flagrant in this movie. So she um, is really main, the only white kind of main character in the whole film. And she doesn't like apparently either of the women that her sons have married who, um, you know, they both married black women or whatever. She doesn't like either of them. And she's trying to hook them up with other black women um, to not be with them. In fact, at one dinner or something, she's in, invited or has another woman who's there. And she's like, oh, you know, they're having trouble talking about their marriage. And, you know, just basically, I wish that she wasn't my daughter-in-law. And she'll say that right in front of her and to her face. So she was just really disrespectful and flagrant. But at the same time, Kelly Rowland really didn't like her mother-in-law. At one point in the movie, <laughs> she says, well, she thinks that just because she has cancer, blah, blah, blah. I was like, wait, <laughs> the woman has cancer and is like really sick. And or you believe that, to be you know, or you believe that because it was no doubt that she yeah. had the cancer. She was basically saying that her husband was wrong because he was caring about his mother with cancer. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, sis. Now we have to, you know, because you always have to think about, okay, so everything that's here, these are ideas and uh, positions and whatever that are being represented, but they're all from from Tyler Perry's mind. So Tyler Perry, like, what are you trying to yeah, say about these because relationships? Because so you, you have to bring the audience along with you. So you have to do things that's going to make them be sympathetic of your main protagonist, right? Or your the main character. Yeah. So if you're like, oh, her husband is bad because of his reasons, because it's his mother's birthday and she has cancer and he wants to be with her, that he has to leave. Then uh, you have to write something to make sure that the audience is like, yeah, I feel bad for her that her husband is leaving because it's his mother's birthday and she has cancer and he cares too much about her. To yeah. be with his wife. Then but to be like with his that wife. didn't exactly happen. That was kind of like a little bit of a mismatch to me because I think we were supposed to completely identify with Mia and. Yeah, but you probably didn't. didn't. That's what I'm saying. But there may be plenty. Right. Because Tyler Perry probably knows his audience way better than we know well, yeah. his audience. So he probably writes these things in because he's like, yeah, they're going to identify with this character. That's why when people watch the Tubi movies and stuff and they be like, yeah, girl, and this was good and stuff is because they're identifying with the perspective that the writers are imposing mm. on those characters. Well, and y'all know this is Axiom Amnesia. And we do ask that you just are open to forgetting about those axioms that we all kind of you know, have been taught and um, are at least question those uh, things that we take to be true or the way stuff is supposed to be. Um, you know, I think it's, it's better when you operate yeah. based on whatever your creed and, right. you know, whatnot is. But the genius writers, what they do is they get you to identify with someone they know is wrong or you know to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And you like, wait a minute, I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm on the side of the guy who's just going around slaughtering people for no reason. Like, what is going on here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a, a really good example of that was this movie um, happened a long, uh, long time ago. I think his name was uh, the movie was called Falling Down. And it's this guy. And I don't know if you remember it, uh, but it's this guy who's like try, just trying to get home from work and he's fed up. And then this the rest of the movie is about everything that happens on the way home from work. And, you know, he just kind of goes postal um, because, he, you know, people have just pushed him over the edge. Like, this is a decent guy um, who was it was Michael Douglas was starring um, this movie Falling Down. And. I, you know, it's it's like that kind of thing. But your identity, you're like, I totally understand why you had to go ahead and just mow them people down because it was ridiculous. <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah. yeah. But so back to this family. So is it that Tyler Perry, is this a Tyler Perry trope where he basically writes the white family? I would say this because she is head of the family. Yeah. Where like the family that prays where the white family is bad or not just bad, but conniving. Mm -hmm. Is it that are there like black families like this? You know, because that's kind of the basis. Well, it's the twist, not the basis. The twist is, oh, my God, look at what the family or the members of this family mm -hmm. are doing. So you said, are there black families that are portrayed in this way? Yeah, Tyler the Perry films and shows. I'm sure it is. I don't oh, yeah. I mean, think about it. Well, maybe not entire families. Well, yes, yes. I I, I would say, and I can't, y'all know Tyler Perry's sugar, other films queen, better sugar, than I do. Not queen sugar, though. But um, what I think is that anytime you, especially when you have the stuff where, you know, family members have done stuff to other family members when they were children and things like that, and you have other family members who are either turning their head or covering it up or not acknowledging those, um, you know, violations against 
uh, people and children then to me i feel like you could say that but that's not exactly conniving yeah but but it's like these people are in cahoots they have this conspiracy Hmm. to do something yeah or do something on behalf of the family which is kind of like get out Right. Which yeah, is why it felt like exactly. you know, because it was a conspiracy against this man who was just trying to right. come with his girlfriend. Even though I weekend. think the family that prays, it was only one person. Right. I, I well, get these the son movies was the up. one who was bad. Right. But he's working on behalf of the family or whatever. But he yeah, he's working the family under the business. Guise yeah. Of the family business but it's called the, family, the family that prays. So that mm-hmm. kind of puts the stigma on the family. Mm-hmm. Anyway. <laughs> you know, but we, we don't I have to think. talk about that movie separate. That's one that I do want to cover on this channel, though, because I I feel like there are just a lot of different dynamics that are going on in there that, um, you know, would be great to explore. Yeah. But I'm saying if that's the case, then I'm not putting any indictment on. I just I just try to figure if you watch enough people who make things, then you get an idea of just these things that they do, like songwriters. You notice what they all do. They all say the same thing. They all make certain same type of songs right people who make movies they all make write the same type of stories over and over like you just have these things that you do when you write a character who's a lawyer it's going to be the same when you write a high power family it's going to be one thing you know that's just Mm -hmm. how people tend to do they have these habits that they just yeah I'm sure when you listen to us, you like, oh, Height said that phrase again. <laughs> yeah, or or because this was Tyler Perry, you're going to like, they're going to hate it. But actually, I think that we did a pretty good job of being fair to the people and predicting that the people who like Tyler Perry and like the certain films, like if you loved Acrimony, you're going to like this movie. I can tell you that now. Really? You, huh. uh, if you liked Acrimony, if you like the haves and have nots, you'll like this movie. You won't look at it as like, oh my gosh, you know. You won't be as... Uh, critical of the film as, as as we were. I don't know. I think Acrimony was probably better in the terms of the story coming together. I think this one, it was one thing and then it just turned into something else just because. Yeah, okay, you you might be right about the storyline as far as it might be more in line with uh, you know, the fall from, a fall from grace. Yeah. With the, you know, stuff coming out of left field like, oh, you know, you get to the end of a fall from grace and you're like, what does you know, <coughs> Social security fraud have to do with have all to of do this. With cigarette or ashtray. You know, ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> the best. What does it have phrase. to do with this unsolved but crime or whatever? What I know. what I can't help but feel like is that there is this element where you can tell that the writer is trying to be outrageous, and and then it just doesn't feel authentic. Versus just something crazy and tragic happening. And I don't know. I think that's the Tubi genre. Y- yeah, that, but, but see, to me, that's what make, keeps it in Tubi and never would give it consideration for, you know, never lets it graduate to any level of like accolades. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, okay. What I will say is I like some of the music in here. I wouldn't, I don't know if I would necessarily you mean call the it the score. score. Or, yeah. Yeah. But okay. so part of it sounded like they did try to take from Get Out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's part from the end of Get Out. That's sort of uh, the pizzicato strings possibly. But yeah, I like the way they played some of the music and stuff. I think the thing that I liked the best uh, about this film was... <laughs> I don't even know. Was Kelly like, Rowland? Yeah, was just being able to see Kelly Rowland. I don't like, think she should have been in the movie, but that's a different you know, story. Acting the film, like okay, <laughs> I, what I liked is that Kelly Rowland was not a disaster, and she didn't have to wear a bad Tyler Perry wig. That's not saying much. I mean, it was just you know, it. This is a movie that, unless for some reason, I'm probably never gonna just choose to watch again. And and this is not me hating Tyler Perry across the board because y'all know I do. You know, I did love The Family That Praise. I love that movie. And I also loved um, Why Did I Get Married, the original one, a lot. So it's not that I hate everything Tyler Perry. It's just, yeah. Yeah. you know, this it just wasn't, it's all right. It was yeah. like, okay, I didn't feel I completely wasted two hours, but on to the next thing. On to the next one. Oh, let me say this. Not about this film, but 
you know, a lot of times YouTube is not showing you everything. Go make sure that you're going to the actual page. Look and see the videos that we've posted lately, not only on this channel, but our other two channels, which are both linked in the description, because we're putting out videos way more frequently than we yeah. have been. Join and our we Discord. Know, yeah, that you guys may not be seeing all of them. So that's it, you know, as far as um, announcements. <laughs> If you made it this far, type artistry in the comments so we'll know you're one of the real ones who stick around for our nice long breakdowns. Thanks so much. And don't forget to let us know if you like these kind of impromptu first reaction reviews. And be sure to check out the video that is on the screen right now.